a boy, believe me. I don't ride and rope. But I was inspired as a kid by uh, the uh, movie stars, Roy Rogers and Gene Autry. So I was inspired by the cowboys of the silver screen, John Wayne and all those guys. And, and many, many years later, these were my heroes growing up, and they had a tremendous influence on my character. And uh, they're still my heroes, but today it's the working cowboy who's, who's my inspiration. Oh, really? Now, a working cowboy would be somebody actually working a ranch or maybe exactly. a rodeo performer or both? It could be. It could, great question. It, it could be both. But in general, the rodeo cowboys grew up on uh, small ranches, generally Oklahoma, Texas, maybe Wyoming, Montana, whatever. And that's a very, very tough life. But these guys uh, live by a code, code of the West. And uh, when I discovered this idea of about 10 years ago, uh, that the code was never written down, Larry. And yet every cowboy knew what it was. I said, well, hmm, how does this work? Oh, wow. Well, I spent about a year out of my life, I'm going to figure this code of the West out. And this is not some Hollywood uh, myth. This is for real. And uh, it's essentially 10 principles to live by. And the cowboys, if, you, if you're going to be a real cowboy, you better live by these principles. And uh, they're pretty simple, basic, common sense, core values, as I call them. What's interesting to me is that in 2010, the state of Wyoming ad, uh, adopted this code out of my book, Cowboy Ethics, as the official code of the state of Wyoming. That's, that's pretty cool. How that cool is very is that? cool. <laughs> Man, just, as far, you, you, as, you kind of like... As far as we know, Wyoming is the only state that has a code, official code. And imagine Florida or even Texas or Louisiana, Mississippi, trying to get a code. You can never get 10 guys or 15 guys to agree on anything. That's but right. in the case of Wyoming, oh, this is a cowboy state. Oh, I love that. They said, we want, to, we want to encourage, I mean, they're going to put you in jail if you don't do it. <laughs> we want to encourage our, maybe they will, uh, uh, we want to encourage all of our citizens to to strive to live up to these this this code. Wow! So you and, so, so because you were interested, cool. you you were interested in the code. You kind of deciphered it and and actually put it into maybe modern day language. That sort of makes you the cowboy Moses. Yeah, I mean, it's like the, the t- Ten Commandments <laughs> of Cowboys. <laughs> well, I tell you, I was living in California at the time the book came out. This is two thousand and four, uh, and I was getting my going to the service station to get some gas, and the attendant said, uh, Mr. Owen, I know all about cowboy ethics. He said, I don't have to read your book. Oh. And I said, well, what is it? He said, he said, shoot first and ask questions later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He said, that's the cowboy code. But we, uh, we do a lot of work with high school kids and middle school kids and uh, I would guess probably half a dozen or more uh, universities in the country uh, use this as a textbook. Uh, two weeks ago, I spoke at Penn State to the faculty, then to the uh, what's called the Honors College. And so there's just a growing awareness that somehow the country is adrift. Now, we can argue all day long about this. But That's right. I'm not into politics. I'm not into Democrats, Republicans, or pointing fingers. And, and, and rather, most of all, I'm anything uh, but a preacher man. So I'm not coming at this as a, as a, as a theologian or professor of philosophy. Mm-hmm. I'm just a guy who turned... Seven years old, a couple of years ago, looked back on my career, but I saw where the country was going, and I said, you know, I'm going to do whatever I can do, which is not a whole lot, perhaps. I'm going to do whatever I can do to just try to contribute to making a positive change. That's and awesome. the result was three books. Cowboy Ethics came out in 2004. Would you all believe, with a title like Cowboy Ethics, the book, the book has sold 130,000 copies. And wow. It's going strong. That's wow. the best seller. Cow- Cowboy Values came out uh, a couple of years later. It's called uh, Subtitle Recapturing What America Once Stood For. This is about our national character. Let me... This latest book is called The Try. The Try. Okay, I want to ask about The Try, but let me just put that on hold just for a second. I have a question for you. I am, I, I wouldn't consider myself any great philosopher or, or thinker or anything like that, but I've often thought that one of the problems we have as people is the... Uh, lack of respect for the the between the the sexes um we we see so much um take for granted like men, men take women for granted women take men for granted maybe more the men versus women uh a part of that 
but I, but I've often thought that the cowboy ethics, at least the way it looked to me, when you when you mentioned like Roy Rogers and people like that, or even the Bonanza guys, they would they would never treat women bad. I mean, women were on a yep. pedestal. Yep. So, are, are, do yep. any of the do any of the Ten Commandments, not to call them that, but do any of the rules of ethics, the cowboy code, do they deal with uh, how to treat a woman? Well, let me read these to you real quick. Okay. okay? And you okay. and Robin, you and Robin, tell me if any of these resonate with you. Okay. The first one is live each day with courage. This doesn't mean now be brave or have courage. Just live each day with courage. There you go. Let's just say you and Robin were facing a debilitating uh, illness. Okay. And you woke up and you said, the doctor said, I'm sorry, you have only a year to live. Nothing we can do. I, I think this might help somebody get through that. So it's, this is not about being a cowboy. It's not about jumping into a river to save a drowning child. It's just looking within yourself and say, if it's over for me, my life, I'm going out with dignity. And I see this everywhere I go. People hold their head up. They don't feel sorry for themselves. And they their last breath, so to speak, is a certain dignity. Mm -hmm. And that's right. what I think it's about, about courage. Yes. But it's not just take pride in your work. This is a real core value to the cowboy. What that means to me is take pride in the simple jobs, the, the, the simple mundane jobs that really nobody wants. We're sort of losing that in this country. It's like, well, I went to college and my grades were okay and, and I'm, I'm, I'm better than, than my job. Well, maybe you are, maybe you're not. But if you don't do your, if you're a young person, you can't, can't take pride in your first job, you'll never get a crack at, at, uh, at a job like you all have got. No, you've got to have that work ethic, show up on time, good attitude, no matter what, no matter how humble the job. And that's a real cowboy trait. Okay. Uh, digging uh, fence posts, that's not much fun. But these guys do it with pride. And it has Three, to be done. Always, right. finish, yeah, always finish what you start. So cowboys hated quitters. As much as they hated uh, cowards, they, they they wouldn't to tolerate uh, quitters. Do what has to be done. We all know what that means. That just means sometimes you got to roll up your sleeve and and do whatever it takes to get through um, some issue or some uh, hurdle. That's right. That's uh, be right. tough. Be tough, but fair. Make a promise. Keep it. This is that cowboy handshake. Uh, ride for the brand. You are, you are riding for your brand, which is the, the radio station in your show, right? Right, right. I never met a radio guy in my life that did this, but talk less and say more. Uh, <laughs> this, this, is, this, is, this is tough. This is tough. But my wife said, why would you ever put this in there? I said, sweetie, I strive to live for these principles. I'm not saying I do it every day. Remember, some things aren't for sale. Reputation shouldn't be for sale. And finally, no one would draw the line. I think that's the one that particularly applies to uh, the sexes. The reason that the cowboys have the respect for the women, and this is not, believe me, this is not some cynical thing, it's not nostalgia, is that women were actually very rare in the, in the Old West. And most of them were like, uh, perhaps taught school, uh, maybe grade school, but, but they were not, quote, professional women. And uh, they were so rare that the cowboys kind of naturally re put them on a pedestal because they, they didn't see them every day. And uh, even today, when you go to the, the real West, like Wyoming or even, or even parts of Texas, it's still yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. I do this instinctively. I think oh, you're I right. Yeah. You're 80 years old or 15, I, I say to every person, D yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. I hold the door. Be careful in Boston with that one, though. <laughs> yeah, we had. Listen, well, be careful. Jim. I got to tell you a funny story. We we had a we had a guest on, and she was in Boston, and she was a a liberated woman, I guess you could say. Yeah. And oh, well, and yeah. I I grew up in New York, where my dad actually taught us his children, myself and my brothers and sister, to say yes, ma'am, yes, sir, and, and all that. It wasn't commonplace, and and we realized that the other kids 
looked at it as kind of funny. So it was kind of more internal in the family than anything else. But when we moved to Florida in the South, it was everywhere. Everybody said, yes, ma'am, yeah. yes, sir, no, ma'am. All right. So, when, so now I got used to it, and I'm doing the radio show, and I'm speak, we're spe- Rob and I are speaking to this lady up in Boston, an author, and as I say, a liberated woman. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she was. And she... <laughs> Read me the riot act or whatever you want. When I said yes, ma'am, she oh, yeah. I am not your ma'am. I On said, the oh, air, oh, she oh. Said it. and I said, I, I apologize. I didn't mean anything disrespectful. <laughs> That's just a, a uh, you know, it's a nice thing to say. No, it's not. Mm-hmm. So, oh man, she let me have Boy. it, Jim. <laughs> yeah, I know. Robin, Robin, how do you, Robin is a woman? How how do you how would you react if uh, if I met you for the first time? I was going to your station, and I said, "Ma'am, let me get the door." Would that offend you or make you say, "What the heck does this guy want from me?" Oh, do you think not, that, Robin. That <laughs> not at all. I really appreciate uh, common courtesy like that, and I I just think it's just respecting for other people. There is no ulterior motive, I believe. One of the things earlier in the list, though, the keeping a promise part, I mean, that's just as much uh, an important element of a marriage. Or that is. I mean, that's the whole point mm-hmm. of a marriage, right? So, mm-hmm. so sure, that, that part applies to the man-woman relationship as well. Mm-hmm. So tell me about what the... We tried, what, we tried, what, we, what I tried to do in the, in the whole motivation is our country today um, is so torn apart. I mean, we all know that. I mean, it is this, the government's dysfunctional and all that stuff. And um, everybody's taking a very hard line, and I would say there are too many, you know, extremists on both parties. Okay, um, and uh, I, think I agree. Are there some are there some basic common sense principles? You can call them values that everybody who's an American says I agree with that. Mm-hmm. And I think if, if if I ever get pushed back and say the cold of West, uh, we're not cowboys, no. Maybe you have your own principle to live by, which is great. You don't have to adopt these ten principles. But I think these ten apply to everybody, whether you're Muslim, Jewish, whether you're French, whether you're whatever you are. That's Black, right. white, yellow, whatever. Right. Yep. And that's what I try to do and say, let's start by agreeing on something. And once we agree on these things, then we can disagree. But I don't get I don't get, I don't get caught in gay marriage or abortion or all that stuff doesn't interest me at all. Those are those are personal values. I'm more interested in what I call societal values that everyone who's an American should say, this we agree on. And, and that's kind of where, where I'm going, this whole cowboy epic stuff. And uh, that's one of the most wonderful things, because what you're proposing to everyone does not know any boundaries. You can be uh, monetarily no. different from the fellow next door, but this is just courtesy. It's common sense. It's actually common caring sense. for your human being. Mm-hmm. It's caring for human being. It's trying to restore some sense of civility, which means we may disagree on some really, you know, hot topics. But let's just start by agreeing on certain basic things. And so, to the cowboy, and, this, and these were not goody goody two shoe guys. We're not going there. We're, what we're saying is, the cowboys uh, at the time of the open range, like 150 years ago, they lived in the unsettled, unsettled west. The sheriff was 500 miles away. So you had to have some kind of a behavior um, expectation, we'll, we'll call it that, so that otherwise we, nobody would know how to act. So it's like a decorum. So this, this kind of took the place of the sheriff or, or, the, uh, or, or the judge. And so we, these were acceptable to the cowboy, and this is what bound the cowboy into a brotherhood. Now, they didn't expect outsiders to live by, the, by this code necessarily. The viewer said, I'm a lawyer from New York. Well, or I'm a banker from Chicago. They wouldn't look at those guys. They were, to, to the cowboy, those were outsiders. But to the cowboy, if you gave a handshake to another cowboy, absolutely inviolate. Would never do that and then break that handshake. Never. That's right. And so wow. I'm intrigued by the idea of we need to go back to basic, common sense, core American values that everybody can agree on, and that's what I'm trying to do, not what I attempt to do. Do you remember the, the TV show McLeod? Not writing. Sure, yeah. 
sure. Oh, yeah, of course. Remember that that was a that was a cool, uh, I, I guess, illustration of kind of where the two worlds met when he was uh, <laughs> wor- working yeah. for the New York City Police Department. James P. Owen is our guest. Uh, I want to ask you about the try specifically while we have a little bit of time left. Uh, yep. I love what you've been saying so far. The founder of the Center for Cowboy Ethics and Leadership. I went to the website cowboyethics.org, and we'll repeat that again before we're done. Cowboyethics.org. The uh, there's a trailer to the try. So the try is a is a is a DVD and it's a book, correct? Mm-hmm. Now is it a the, is the it a story? Is cel- the try, yeah, the try is a celebration of, of of the American what I call the American character, and it's that can do spirit that enabled us to settle the West and and uh, win a world war and put a man on the moon. And I, right. I, my concern is that we're losing... Oh, man, you're that right. Country, we're losing that can-do spirit. And what's replaced it, and I, I, I don't mean to go on a tangent from here, but what's replaced it is kind of an in, entitlement mentality that I, the government or somebody owes me something. And that's the opposite of this can-do spirit. And so what we did, we, we profiled 12 people. As it turns out, Six men, six women. We didn't, you know, that wasn't the idea. The, the inspiration came from a guy named Ty Murray. And Ty is king of the cowboys. He lives up in Stephenville, Texas. Amazing guy. Married, by the way, to Jewel, the singer. Oh, really? Ty seven, oh, yeah. Ty is seven times world champion all around cowboy. And I met him, and he loves the book Cowboy Ethics. I sat in his living room and I said, Ty, what made you special? There were a lot of good athletes. This guy's like 170 pounds. Maybe he's five feet eight, maybe, and would climb on a 2,000-pound bull. I said, Tom, what made you special? And he said, Jim, when I was a little kid, my mom said, Tom, you were born with an extra supply of try. And I got a big grin. And I said, what the <laughs> hell is that? What the hell does that mean? I, I never heard that. Yeah, what right. the cowboy does, the, the cowboy takes a verb. So you and Robin would say, we're trying to do something. They take the verb and they turn it into a noun. That cowboy, he's got to try. And that means it's the highest form of respect you can pay a cowboy. It means that guy gives it everything he's got in the bottom of his guts, whatever he's doing. Wow. And then there are a few, there are a few cowboys, and Ty is one. If Ty were to walk into a room of cowboys, anywhere in the country, anywhere, they would say, fellas, here comes Ty Murray. That cowboy, he's got the try. And that means 110% effort. I don't care what he's doing. If he's waiting tables. Okay, right. If he's sweeping floors. If he's a janitor in the radio station, there ain't no janitor in any radio station that can, that can touch this guy. And there's something about that. There's a pride of giving it your all. And so when, Ty, when we were talking about this, he said, Jim, when I climbed down the bowl, he said, I couldn't guarantee you I was going to win a gold buckle. He said, I couldn't guarantee you I was going to last eight seconds. Larry, he poked me in the chest with his finger. I almost cried. It hurt so bad. <laughs> he said, but I golf during, he got right in my face. He said, but I golf during dinner. I tell you, I'm going to try my guts out. You know what I mean? Try my guts out. <laughs> and I said, oh, my God. I was crying on the one hand with the pain. Uh-huh. And then I said, oh, my God, I love this guy. So I went out and said, I'm going to find some other people with try. And they're all over the place. And these are ordinary people who've done extraordinary things, but they're ordinary. They're not superstars. And I said, what's the common thread among these amazing stories? The first woman, American woman to climb Mount Everest. Uh, it goes on and on. Every, every story is different. Oh, I love but it. I love what common, you're saying. The common, the common thread is they all had this thing called, called try. And to me, try is grit, guts, and heart. And this is what we need to celebrate in America. It's that guy who grew up with, with at a disadvantaged household. Maybe his mom and dad didn't speak English. Maybe he didn't, his parents didn't even go to high school. It doesn't matter. It's what have you got inside yourself? And um, we, are, we were taking this message to kids across the country saying, it's, you, know, you, you, you start with an attitude, a good attitude, positive attitude. Bad attitude, there's no jobs for you with a bad attitude. It's that simple. Well, I'm looking forward to ad- reading the book, Jim. Uh, James P. Owen is our guest. We're almost out of time. Real quick question. Is the DVD uh, a full-length movie? 
It's a 35-minute documentary. Okay. We simply, Larry, went out and filmed the people in the book. I got gotcha. you. We actually went out and filmed okay. time after the book came out. We said, I, I, got, I got to film this. We went back to Tom Murray and his ranch and sat there, and he is an amazing guy. I've never, one of the most interesting, rare people I've ever met in my life. And you see it when he looks in the camera. He's very quiet, very private, almost shy. But when he, when he talks, he just captures the... the, the the, 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 the camera. But everyone has their own dignity, their own uh, success, as they define it. So we're, not, we're not talking about making money. It's not even making money. It's just success. It's their own definition of success. Whatever that well, means. And, I, and I think it's the spirit that made this country what it became. And I think you're dead, I think you're dead on. It's the spirit that's also lacking right now that we need more of. So hopefully the book, the movie, the, the, the documentary will uh, get a little bit more of it going again. Um, I hope so. Uh, James P. Owen, what an honor to be able to speak to you. I apologize again for the oh, problem hey, at I'm the honored. beginning. Uh, well, Robin and Larry, I want to thank you all, and I, I, I hope the message resonates with you all and, and with uh, some of your audience, and I would just encourage you, well, just, just go to Amazon and check out these, uh, or, or Barnes & Noble, and check these books out, and uh, if it touches your heart, then, you know, borrow a copy or go to the library, whatever. The try. The try. And, and, and so just real quick, quick uh, just re-mentioning the website that I went to, cowboyethics.org. You will see uh, James P.O. and you'll see a trailer to The Try as well as some information about the book, The Try. Uh, Jim, thank you for being on the air with us. We were spellbound. I, I, was, I was honored. I was honored. Thank you. We will take a little break and be right back. <laughs> You're Thank listening you to Thank WOCA you News Talk 1370, Ocala's source for what's happening in today's hottest up-to-date news and topics. Here's what you may have missed on the John Tesh Radio Show. Would you like to burn more fat and lose weight faster? Just exercise on an empty stomach. If you're looking for work, your skills and experience may matter less than your personality. Almost 60% of HR managers rate people with interests similar to theirs higher than applicants with better skills. Couples, we need to practice healthy conflict resolution during the day to get better sleep at night. Intelligence for your life on the John Tesh Radio Show. Don't miss this stuff. You've got a garden and we've got a show for you called You've Got a Garden with your host, Master Gardener Carol Ann Baldwin. Carol Ann answers your questions about your flowers, your veggies, your grass, your trees, even questions about your bugs. And she's only on WOCA, so don't miss Carol Ann Baldwin and You've Got a Garden each Tuesday from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. right here on WOCA The Source. Here are today's headlines from the source, WOCA. Florida Senators Bill Nelson and Marco Rubio furloughed most of their employees and closed state offices as a government shutdown began yesterday. Floridians who routinely contact Nelson's office for help with Social Security checks, passport applications, and veterans benefits are on their own for now because congressional staffs have been sent home, Nelson said on the Senate floor yesterday. The federal government is furloughing about 800,000 of its roughly 2.1 million workers. The largest group exempt from the furloughs consists of employees necessary to protect public health, safety, or property. Property could include government data, research experiments, or other intangibles. Political appointees are exempt because they cannot be placed on leave by law. Employees necessary for the president to carry out his constitutional responsibilities are exempt. Finally, employees whose salaries are paid from sources outside an annual spending bill can still get paid and report to work. The Marion County Sheriff's Office is reporting that they are searching for a man who they believe went into a woman's home in Reddick and demanded sex from her, and then, when she rejected his demand, got into a fist fight with her. The report says the unidentified 30-year-old victim identified the man as Kevin Dwayne Bubba Patterson. The victim told deputies she was asleep when she heard several knocks on the windows and door at her home. She opened the door and saw Patterson, who then told the woman that he wanted to have sex. She replied that she was not interested and Patterson then allegedly punched her in the stomach. The woman fought back as they fell outside onto the ground and Patterson then got away in a car driven by an unknown driver. Patterson faces a charge of occupied burglary with battery. Anyone with information as to his whereabouts can call the sheriff's office at 732-9111, Crime Stoppers at 368-STOP, or you can text the tip to 274-637 using the keyword 368-STOP. 
Lawyers for Ocala Regional Medical Center plan to file a motion today with the First District Court of Appeal asking it to reconsider its decision that the University of Florida Health Shands Hospital had a legal interest in the hospital's new trauma center and that the case should have been heard by the Florida Department of Health during the trauma center application process, according to a report in the Star Banner. The report states that Shands contends that the Florida Department of Health did not have the authority to grant Ocala Regional permission to open its trauma center last year and says the new trauma program is costing Shan's business. Ocala Regional is arguing that the trauma center is needed in our community. The report substantiates that need by citing figures that say Ocala Regional has treated 1,469 trauma patients since opening in December with a 97% survival rate. The Sun Sentinel newspaper is reporting that South Florida could join the major leagues of casino gambling and see a huge economic boost if the state allows full-scale resort casinos, according to the draft of a long-awaited report of the future of gambling in Florida. The opening of two major gambling resorts in Broward and Miami-Dade counties could generate about $1 billion in taxable gambling revenue per year and create 7,618 full-time jobs under one scenario analyzed in a report to the state legislature by Spectrum Gaming Group. Spectrum looked at 12 scenarios in its 464-page report, ranging from only slot machines and paramutuals to statewide destination casinos. The study was commissioned by the state legislature after lawmakers put off highly controversial, heavily lobbied decisions on whether the state should become a world destination for blackjack, baccarat, slots, and roulette. Senate and House leaders yesterday extended the deadline for the final version of the report to November 1st after state economists raised questions about the statistical models used in the study. And those are the headlines from the source, WOCA 96.3 FM and 1370 AM. Phoenix Promotional Solutions, your company supplier of banners, digital decals, yard signs, and magnetic signs. Where you give them approved artwork by noon, the next day by 4 p.m., you pick up your banners, digital decals, yard signs, and magnetic signs. Phoenix Promotional Solutions, 368-2404. That's 368-2404. Don't forget, they do vehicle wraps also. Phoenix Promotional Solutions, 368-2404. Ocala's Information Station, 1370 WOCA. Ocala! All right, six minutes after 10 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in this uh, the, the Wednesday morning. I think what day it was. Yes. You know, it's funny. As I was looking over the notes for our next interview, I don't know why, but the movie Mr. Mom came to mind. And, and, and let me tell you why Mr. Mom came to mind. If you remember this film, it's been some time ago. Uh, the main character, I don't remember the actor's name. Do you remember? Michael Keaton. Michael Keaton, thank you. He has basically let himself go. He lost his job, and now he's, you know, he's getting heavy and he's got a beard and he's just and, he, and he's just you know he's fallen into a slump and then all of a sudden something clicks and he pulls himself out of it yeah. well who can't relate to that uh-huh. our next guest can relate to it to the max i mean to the extreme <laughs> yeah. uh he's been with us before and you know sometimes the lower you go the higher you go. And, and I think he's a great example of that. John Espinosa Nelson has been with us before. You might remember him as the bookstore bandit. I just heard him tell Robin. He got that from the FBI, that name. <laughs> I love that. Robin moniker. was complimenting him on the on the moniker. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you can thank the FBI for that one. Uh, he's a very talented writer. He contributes articles to different magazines and... Uh, Talking Toys, it says. That's interesting. Yeah, He's a cool. uh, Surviving members of the Real Band of Brothers is also on my notes here. The book is called Where Excuses Go to Die. He has an amazing story. I'll let him tell it, of course. Good morning, John Espinosa Nelson. Good morning, John. Good morning. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Where are you? Uh, I'm in Los Angeles. L.A. Well, thank you for getting up early to be with us today. Um you know, we were trying to think off the air how long it's been since you've been with us, and I think it's been more than a year. Our, how long ago, let's see, was, what was the last day you were in prison? How long ago? Uh, the day before my birthday in 1994 is when I actually walked out the door. 1994. Wow. That doesn't it? seem that long ago. Mm-hmm. It's, what, 19 years ago now? Yeah. It, yeah. it doesn't seem long to me either, but uh, I'm told that it is. And how long were you in prison? 
Uh, it was four years. I was sentenced to eight, and uh, due to California prison overcrowding at the time uh, and good behavior, I, I served um, four years. My goodness. And you were serving because you were robbing bookstores? Started off with bookstores and graduated to banks very stupidly. <laughs> <laughs> well, how symbolic this was that you were released right before your birthday because, boy, you certainly must have had a moment of reflection there. Well, the, you know, the whole journey from the, from the moment that uh, I got busted and arrested uh, to, to even on into today is, a, is literally a Christmas tree of symbolism and things that have come full circle in a, in a, in a poignant manner. Uh, I'm constantly seeing things that are closing up, and I'm getting a lot of closure on even all these years later. Really? Really? Um, yeah, it's reflected in the book. Now, I know we did this once before when you were on with us, but tell, tell us about the first robbery you did. Well, I had, uh, I had, I had, I got the idea from some some friends that that worked in a bookstore. I hung out at bookstores, and I had a girlfriend that worked at a bookstore. And and while there, I picked up uh, some information that re- stayed dormant. It really didn't mean anything to me at the time. Like, for example, when the safe was open, when the registers were counted and emptied, and the deposit was taken to the bank, etc. Well, about six years later, long after we had all moved on, uh, I had managed to put myself into financial straits, uh, and rather than find a solution, uh, somehow that information just came rushing forward. And uh, at the time that I was hanging out at the bookstore, one of the other employees had been robbed, and some guy came in waving a gun and yelling, and the, uh, the employee, our friend, uh, sort of yawned and decided I hate my job, I hate this company, I can't stand the manager, and happily emptied the register for him and then gave him the other register next to that one and oh. sent him on the way. And that was information that also just sort of stayed in my head. And then later on, when it all came rushing forward and this larcenous door opened up in front of me, I thought, now what if I was to walk in with a fake gun in my belt and pull the T-shirt tight behind my back so that they could see the outline of the gun? I I wouldn't have to take it out. They'd think it was real. And I just politely said, you know, no hard feelings. It's not your money. Let me just grab some of that, and I'll be on my way, and it'll be great. I was sort of counting on that person to that young person, probably the same age as me, to be equally as apathetic and indifferent uh, as that person was who related that story to us. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. So I applied that same idiotic thinking, uh, that same over-intellectualizing of, of basically a criminal illegal act to approximately uh, 45 more robberies. 45? Wow. wow. But that really is um, pathetic when when you think not on your part, but of the people that you were robbing, that they just... Didn't care. They didn't care about they uh, thought their, he was gonna be their killed. life or, or, or the <laughs> business they worked for. Well, it was, it was mostly my assigning this to them. It wasn't necessarily true in all cases. Uh, for example, uh, uh, during my preliminary hearing, there were several witnesses that they brought forward that said they were absolutely paranoid and, I mean, excuse me, terrified. Terrified, and yeah. I heard that. Uh, when I heard that, I, I felt about an inch tall because it was never my intention to even scare anyone. I just would automatically assume everybody hated their job and, um. you know, saw me as a ge- I was being generally polite. I wasn't yelling at anybody and, and that it would be a, a, a more of a transaction than a robbery. And, and I actually believed that. And that's, that's the self delusion that I was operating at, you know, and that wake up call didn't happen. Uh, those things weren't. Oh, yeah. You know, I, you, you know what you reminded me of? When I, when I was in high school in New York, there was a, another student, a kid, who uh, was kind of one of those guys who always got in trouble. And I remember him trying to t- tell me the difference between robbing and stealing. Oh. He said, stealing is when you take from somebody you, like your brother, and that's not good. But robbing, it's a store. Nobody cares. Oh. I, and I remember saying what? to him, yeah, you're crazy. And, sh- you know, sure enough, he ended up uh, in, in jail. I don't, I don't know whatever became wow. of him because I moved away, but... Uh, but but sometimes we do that. Maybe that's maybe you're you're kind of giving us some insight into how the criminal mind works. They they don't look at themselves as doing something wrong. I, I wish that I could say you know we, we hear stories like that every day. We see them on the news, stupid criminals, and we think, boy, that person is really dumb. And and that very thinking that you just explained, I, I wish that I could have said, oh, I'm I'm not that dumb. But in fact, I was. <laughs> and I did think that way. Well, and so what snapped? How did you turn around? Well, as soon as I 
entered the environment of uh, you know incarceration as soon as I was stuck in that in that world um, it, it, it very very quickly became apparent to me that I was going to have the fight of my life literally and, and, and metaphorically and um, you know all of the excuses and this over intellectualizing and this this justifications that I came up with to 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 commit these crimes and to act this way um, these were my excuses and being surrounded by nothing but excuses I very quickly learned how little mine, how little they were worth. They were worth nothing. Uh, and as far as the eye could see and, and, and the ears could hear, was nothing but excuse after excuse after excuse. That was wake-up call number one among many. Uh, but in that, uh, in that world, I was lucky enough to be um, hired as a, as a teacher's aide and uh, connected with some civilian employees uh, uh, educators uh, there in the various facilities that I was sent to, and they saw my potential, potential that I wasn't uh, uh, keen to, and, and uh, sort of took me under their wing and encouraged me to better myself, and we had many, many hours of long discussions about character, and, and, um, and, and in my effort to stay busy and keep my mind occupied and stay off the street corner that is the prison yard, uh, I was keeping myself in an environment where I had uh, an opportunity to learn better choices. Did and that's the, really where it began. Did the other prisoners try to dissuade you or hurt you in any way so they could make, you know, you feel like you're lower than low and, and they're, you know, the king of the road and they can do anything they want? Um, that was more or less uh, from breakfast to lunch. lunch oh, to you know, every day. I mean, you know, I I uh, I was fortunate in that I I was defiant, so I stood up for myself, and I I let people know right away. You know, a, a lot of times it was arrogance; it wasn't even really defiance. I got, I got to prison, and I was smarter than everybody there. And when I walked in the prison gates, I was too good for prison. Oh and wow! That that arrogance, that blind arrogance, sort of was taken by some of the, you know, predatory, you know, shot collar type yard guys uh, as, uh, as an equal to their own defiance, and they more or less identified with it. I just wouldn't let uh, any of them jump on me and tattoo me with swastikas or, you oh. know, pull me into a gang or anything like that. I just I had to put my foot down, and unfortunately, uh, I had to put my fists up for them to get the message on occasion, but <laughs> in general, <laughs> oh, in gee. general, it was not, uh, it was not quite as terrible for me in, in certain circumstances than it, than it was for other inmates. Oh. And uh, just for, just to tap into the, your, the self-defense, uh, part of what you just said, I don't think you need an excuse for self-defense. I mean, if someone's trying to hurt you, mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're, I want to talk about the book a little bit where excuses go to die, but I mean... If somebody says to you, why did you do that? And your excuse, quote unquote, is because he was trying to hurt me. Well, that, that's, a, that's an okay excuse, I think. Uh, you don't want that oh, excuse to die, right? Um, no, unfortunately, the watch commander might not see it that way. And you go to the hole right along with the guy that was trying to attack you. And that's the way of the world in there. Oh, oh okay, okay. Uh, so, okay, one quick question before we talk about the book. Talking toys. Why is that on my list here? What do you do with that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's actually something from my past, from my bio. I actually was hired at, uh, after my release. I did have some opportunities to, to, to write for different employers. A couple of software companies during the dot-com boom hired me to write copy for them. And I actually got a contract with Mattel Toys. And, uh, <laughs> and I worked uh, in the sound design studio at Mattel, uh, writing lines of dialogue for the actors that would come in and do the voiceover for the toys. Oh, like, wow. The, the Barbie uh, answering machine, and I, I enjoyed at that time telling my friends uh, and their and, and their children, I'm the guy that writes what uh, the dolls say. <laughs> 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 oh, that's too funny. Uh, all right, talk. The, where excuses go to die? Is this a memoir? It is. It is. It covers that 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 prison sentence and what led up to it and the aftermath. And did you write this as a way to get it off your chest? Did you write it as a way to maybe persuade somebody else to stop making excuses? What What was the motivation behind writing it? Well, you know, at the time uh, during my incarceration, uh, I had taken uh, several uh, creative writing courses. I love to write, and there were just too many signs pointing toward. You need to you need to pursue this as, as something bigger than just you know a, a, a cathartic release. 
you're actually good at this. And there were those, some of those civilian educators and, and uh, employees that, that kept encouraging me and a few other influences. And so um, I kept a journal. I kept writing. I entered some contests, and, uh, and, and that path was sort of laid out before me in terms of a healthy uh, uh, release, you know, and it became a little bit more advanced, a little bit more advanced until – uh, some of these teachers uh, uh, had said, uh, uh, you, you've got a very ridiculous, meaningful story to tell, uh, and you probably should consider getting this put into a book. And so, you know, when I came home, I needed to take some time to prove to myself that I wasn't going to reoffend. So I stuck my nose to the grindstone, and I hung lights on movie and commercial sets for, for several years and, 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 and wrote on the side, but didn't really get serious with the book until after I had started reading some of my old journal entries at some open mic nights and some coffee houses. And, uh, you know, a, a rock video producer, a friend of mine, said, uh, you, you have to stop reading this stuff for your friends and impressing your friends and really take this material seriously because you're making a lot of people laugh and really think. You know, you really need to put this into a book. And so... Um, a lot of the circumstances that happened uh, um, and the way life works, you know, after my release, I, I now look back and realize that uh, I had to become the kind of person who was capable of telling the story in a meaningful way and that the timing of this book all these years later is something that has only added to its potential to reach other people. So and were you... Were you uh, were you a writer before? And, or, or if, and if not, did this uh, kind of spawn something for you where you started writing more after the book was done? I was a talker, is what I was. I talked about writing, but I never wrote. Okay. And, you know, this, once, once, once the cement was cracked here and, 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 and you could start to, uh, to uh, once I started to listen and things started to actually come into my head instead of the world only being around about me, I was actually able to start learning to apply myself, and then the stakes got raised in that environment when the writing came uh, to become a, 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 a bit of a survival tool, an important one. Um, and then and it just matured as a craft and a talent uh, in the years following. Hmm. Uh, so are there other books since then? Uh, this is my first published book. There's another one uh, on the heels of this one uh, uh, that, that I'm enjoying rewriting right now. It's called Sellouts for People Too, and that's about musicians here in L.A., so I'm going to have a lot of fun with it. Ah, okay. <laughs> do, do you, uh, are you in a uh, relationship right now? Was, was it hard to uh, get back into the swing of things because of your reputation? I, I am, in fact, married. I've been with my wife, Crystal, for 14 years, 15 in October. And we've been married for uh, ten, uh, and um, it it was it was difficult uh, a little bit at first to to adjust to normal social behavior, but I picked it up pretty pretty qu- pretty quickly. It wasn't it wasn't too bad. Wow, uh, the book again is is called "Where Excuses Go to Die: A Coming of Age Journey Through His Time in Prison and Beyond." And the uh, author is our guest, John Espinosa Nelson, out in Los Angeles, right? Correct. Out in L.A. Um, so, so give us some of the uh, excuses that you had that we might be using also. We might not be robbing bookstores, but yeah. we certainly make excuses for some of our shortcomings. Our, and let's see if they, they apply to us. <laughs> well, I would, I would probably have to start with, I didn't do it. Uh, you see, we're, we're all sort of raised uh, to, instead of stepping up and being... Uh, the person that made the mistake, that could own the mistake and then learn from the mistake, you know, society kind of sends this mixed message of not being the person that made the mistake in the first place. And we we tend to go with that because a lot of us, myself included, uh, I would rather just appease the first immediate pressure that's before me to do away with it as quickly and easily and conveniently as possible. And so I'm tempted to use an excuse where I start to, because of my past and lessons I've learned, where I start to want to challenge myself is if I do make a mistake, uh, however small or what have you, if I say something rude to someone, it, it's easier for me uh, to, to just step forward and say, okay, that I'll own that, that's mine, and then step away and, and be that guy that made that mistake. Because even if I don't have some lesson to learn there, that, that, that practicing uh, of defying that temptation, yeah. is, it, for me, it's very healthy. John, let me, let me ask you something about uh, my mistakes. I have a mistake I want to share with you. 
that I make. I've been told I make this, and I don't know that I'll ever stop making this mistake. It is the mistake of not forgiving. Um, th- and I've been told that this is a shortcoming of mine. If, for example, I, have, I had a cousin um, who raped my sister. Um, we didn't find out about it till many, many years later. She has since passed away, and so has he. Mm -hmm. he also raped uh, one of his nieces um and i and after he was after all through with that and went through the therapy and and swore up and down he's a a changed man would never do it again there was a member of the family i think was his father who would have been my uncle Mm -hmm. and the, the guy my cousin i guess i could say his name johnny johnny got up in front of the funeral and he started to speak and everybody was like oh come on why does he have to speak and he sensed that the family was really not that happy that he was up there speaking but he wanted to say something about his father and he said there are some people in this world who can forgive as christ commanded and there are those who will never forgive and i thought well that's me i'm never going to forgive i have i do not have the ability to forgive and that's a mistake that i'm probably never going to not make and, and, and when I've had that kind of sentiment, when I've expressed that sentiment on the air before, I cannot tell you how many letters I got on email or phone calls I got later in the day, people trying to, you know, uh, counsel me, Larry, you should really forgive, it's for you, it's yeah. not for him. And I always think, you know what, maybe that is a mistake, but it, you're talking to somebody that's a, I'm a hard, so I, my excuses will not die on that one. I'm always going to have the excuse that it, there's... I don't know. It's, so in, in your world, I, it sounds like, I mean, I, I know that you robbed some stores, but it sounds like nobody was left bleeding or dying or, or physically hurt. So it might be way easier to forgive you than it would be for me to forgive my cousin. You know what I mean? Uh, I do know what you mean, and uh, I'm sorry that that happened. Uh, I, I wouldn't be able to really uh, give you any advice uh, to, to dislodge that, that sort of logjam you have, that you, you seem to have your arms crossed on that issue pretty pretty firmly. Uh, I don't know really what kind of a psychological pry bar to stick in there, but <laughs> like some of the other people that uh, have counseled you in your letters that you mentioned, uh, it, it is for you, number one. Um, I would, I would, I would want to look at it. Uh, I would tend to, to to look at it from almost a military tactical standpoint. In that, what information am I not getting here? I want to lay of the land. I want to know what the, where the battlefield is. I want to know what's out in front of me. Well, by you not listening to that person's uh, side of the story, by you not stepping forward and getting that dialogue going, just showing that person that you're willing to listen for, okay, good, you got three minutes, go, and then I walk, (laughs) whatever, even if it's that small. What you're denying yourself is a lay of the land. You're denying yourself more of the information uh, because you don't have all the information. We know that for sure, because nobody can't read each other's minds. So if not for any other reason, just to give yourself a tactical standpoint moving forward, I mean, we are talking about familial uh, connections and emotions here, not in the military, but just in terms of having all of that information lined up in your, in your head uh, uh, to, to allow you to at least proceed with all of that information rather than denying something that may just make you go, okay, that person was screwed up in their youth, they were sick, or this person is sick, at least now I know that that person is sick, and I can step away and not maybe, maybe, maybe spend a little bit less of my soul hating them or not forgiving them or keeping my arms crossed on this issue mm-hmm. and relax a little bit and take that much, maybe a little spoonful of stress out of your life and throw it away. So if, that, so, that, that, uh, burden. So if excuses can die... In other words, if let's let's just say t- using my little example there, uh, that he's let's say he was to come to me, which he never did. Mm-hmm. I wrote him a letter asking him to, but he never did, yeah. and it's too late now. But if he did, and he came to me, he said, "You know what? I was going to give you some excuses. I was going to say I was I was uh, you know influenced by pornography or whatever." Mm-hmm. But you know what? Those are excuses, and I have no excuse. I'm just sorry. I'm so sorry. I have no excuses. Then his excuses have now died, which I love. I love that fact that that would happen. But I don't know that I'd be <laughs> able to change my opinion about him, to be honest. And, and it would be kind of like somebody who lost people in the Holocaust having Hitler come to them and say, you know what, I don't know what I was thinking. I'm so sorry. 
Uh, too bad. You're not. <laughs> yeah. You're not getting off that easy. And those uh, well, yeah, let's, uh, girls, uh, eleven years old. I mean, gosh. I, I, I there's no question. Uh, you know, having said everything that I I had just said about about having the willingness to listen. Um, I, you know, I, in the big scheme of things, I do, I do think it's okay if you don't do anything at all, because frankly, that person does sound like a scumbag, and that's probably the first thing <laughs> that my head would go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Well, thank you for being on my side with that one. Uh, um, uh, I, you know, I've enjoyed talking to you in the past. I remember conversations, so I, I always, I, when the next book is done, I can't wait for you to come on and talk about it. Ooh, Robin and I do music too, so it'll be fun to hear some of those stories. Yeah. And we knocked on doors in L.A. too, so we kind of know that little, <laughs> kind of a, a sampling of that anyway. Um, the books, you know, we had, by the way, real quick, we had a, a gentleman, really nice guy, ran for the office of sheriff in our county and also was a felon. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and, and came right out and said what he had done. I don't, I don't remember anymore what he had done, but uh, but clearly said, you know, I've turned my life around and... and um, he probably would have made a good sheriff. I'm not, I'm not campaigning for him. He's, it, the, the election is done, but it's just... I, I do believe people can turn around. I don't know that people will always forgive uh, somebody who's done something. In your case, probably everybody's let you off the hook because, I mean, it almost sounds like... Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's probably you scared them. I know that, but they probably let, let it go. Uh, John, how, how do we get the book? Or where do we go? Do you have a website? Uh, I do. Uh, the book is available everywhere books are sold. You can go most conveniently to, to one of the online retailers, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Uh, pick it up there, I think, for your usual Amazon discount. Uh, it is available as a paperback. It is available in all e-formats e for your readers. Uh, you can get, there's a link on my website to, for both of those, where excusesgotodie.com. Okay. I have a blog where each week I put up uh, an another excuse I think is ridiculous. Government shut down anyone. I think that's <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I basically make fun of people's excuses, whether they're politicians or, or uh, say, leaving a mattress on the side of the road because you don't feel like dealing with it. Ooh, that's a pet peeve of mine. And Ooh. that's the kind of stuff you'll find on the blog, plus links about the book, about the story, and a little bit more about my background. Oh, I, lo I just went to your site. I like the way you look. You look the way you sound. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, oh, very cool. Okay, where excuses go to die dot com is the website I just went to. Uh, John Nelson, uh, the Espinosa part is not on the website. John Nelson, uh, thank you for being on the air. Uh, one of these days, maybe you can come and be in the studio with us if you're ever on this coast. Um, thank you for getting up early, and uh, I love the conversation. It was great. Well, thank you again for having me, and I'll be happy to join you guys in the studio when I visit. That'd be great. We'll take a little break. We'll be right back. Life may not come with guarantees, but buying your next vehicle from Ford Lincoln of Ocala sure does. Start with their seven-day new vehicle price guarantee. If you find the identical new Ford or Lincoln vehicle anywhere else for less, Ford Lincoln of Ocala will refund you 110% of the difference. That's guaranteed. In the market for a quality pre-owned vehicle? Buy with confidence with Ford Lincoln of Ocala's 30-day pre-owned exchange policy. That's guaranteed. Ford Lincoln of Ocala's goal is to make buying your next vehicle fun, simple, fast, and guaranteed. Shop Ford Lincoln of Ocala today on North Highway 441, open seven days a week, or shop at home at FordofOcala.com. A seven-day new vehicle price guarantee, a 30-day pre-owned vehicle exchange policy. That's buying with confidence. That's buying from Ford Lincoln of Ocala. That's guaranteed. Ford Lincoln of Ocala reserves the right to verify quotes, advertise prices, 30-day pre-owned exchange policy, or 1,000 miles from date of purchase. Does not apply to vehicles sold as is. See dealer for complete details. Hurricane season is upon us. WOCA and Sunbelt Rentals wants you to be prepared. Sunbelt Rentals has the equipment to help, like air nailers, aerial lifts, chainsaws, chippers, and stump grinders. They have light towers, skid steer loaders, and generators, just to name a few. Sometimes you might need a little help cleaning up afterwards. Sunbelt has the equipment you need, like dehumidifiers, pumps, sewer snakes, wet dry vacs, floor dryers, carpet equipment, and more. And right now is the time to get it done, with two special offers just for WOCA listeners. If you rent Friday after 3 p.m. 